Hi, like I said in my previous video, I'll test the longest loop of wire in the history of mankind on YouTube. Longer than Veritasium's loop, longer than Alpha Phoenix's loop to achieve greatness. When you see it, you go long, long loop. Long. So long. Oh, you don't know what this is about? Don't you watch my channel? Well, the test case is from Veritasium's video. Basically, in his imaginary case, we have a switch and battery connected to a bulb through zero resistance wire so long that it would take one second for electricity to travel the length of the loops at the speed of light. But wires are one meter apart. How long does it take for the light bulb to turn on after we close the switch? His answer was, since the wires are one meter apart, only after one meter over C speed of light or around 3.3 nanoseconds, there will be enough energy radiated to the other side to turn some lamps on. Which is right, the electricity doesn't need to travel the full length of the loop before the lamp receives some energy right at the beginning. So here I am with a thousand feet or almost 305 meters of Cat5 Ethernet cable and I'll test the theory with over 2.4 kilometers or 8,000 feet of loop and I'll do it as is in my room. Hmm, why should I stretch it straight over a vast field when I can't do it as is in the comfort of my room? You might say, but Mehdi, in Derek's question, the wires were spaced one meter apart. Cat5 wires are like one millimeter apart. Meh, it doesn't matter. His wires were 300,000 kilometers long. It doesn't matter. Cat5 wires are twisted pair. His wires were straight. Doesn't matter. His wires were going in a straight line. Yours is looped like a transformer. It doesn't matter. Well. It seems my claims may have caused you to feel aroused. Then I bet you'll also enjoy my sponsor Brilliant, who with their highly interactive and well-designed courses in math, computing and science are guaranteed to tickle your brain juice. More at the end. Back to the test case, let's try something. So I have the thousand foot cable with four twisted pairs. Let's pick only one of the twisted pairs, say the blue one, and my test setup will be a little bit different. See, instead of two large loops like this, I short one side and have one large loop on one side only. But that's different! It doesn't matter! The reason it doesn't matter is, if in the original setup it would take, say, one second for the electricity to travel through two loops to get to the load, now it still takes one second but through one loop. The load experiences a similar delay and the setup is simpler. I'm using an LED as the lamp connected to the loop of wire and I also have a DC power supply on one side connected to the LED and on the other side I'll connect it to the twisted pair. So how long do you think it will take from when I connect the power to when the LED turns on? Well, too quick and we won't be able to see. So instead of shorting the end of the loop, I'll leave it open. Now you're just changing everything! It doesn't matter! And the reason it doesn't matter is, the entire theory here was that the electric fields from the switch side take pico to nanoseconds to reach the LED to turn it on. Long before the electric fields reach the end of the loop to discover if it is short or not. So it doesn't matter at the beginning if the end is short or open. Now if I leave the loop open, the LED should stay off if our wave theory is wrong. But if it blinks on and off, the theory is right. As we predicted, the energy reaches the LED before the waves reflect from the open circuit bringing the information back that the circuit is open and the LED turns off. With the end of the loop open, let's see if it blinks. Just pay attention, it might be too quick. Ready? Boop. Oh, I think I saw it blink. And it's not blinking anymore. Instead of a switch, I'll connect a function generator with a pulse train to constantly turn it on and off. Maybe we can see it better. Now it'll shine. Nothing. Oh, I know. <laughs> Here, I have a 10 kilo ohm resistor and I'll put it across the LED. Ding! 
and it turns on. <laughs> Isn't it funny that adding a load across the LED actually helps it? Okay, the reason is simple. An LED is a diode and two wires being close are acting like capacitors. Capacitors are how we model electric fields from one side affecting the other side. So when we have a positive pulse, current runs through the LED turning it on and charging the voltage of the capacitance between the wires. So when the pulse drops, the diode is reversed by us and is off. So there is no reverse current to discharge the capacitor and in the next pulse, there is not enough voltage across the LED to turn it on. But we add a resistor across the LED and the capacitor can discharge through the resistor when the pulse is low and in the next cycle, the LED can again turn on. In any case, again in Veritasium setup, the reason the lamp receives energy in 3.3 nanoseconds is that as current travels through the bottom wire and it becomes charged, Electric fields travel the gap and attract and pull opposite charges on the top wire creating current. As I explained in my previous video, we model this effect by placing capacitors between wires and also wire inductors as a transmission line. Charging these line capacitors is what sends current through the load and the line is seen as a resistor to the traveling waves. Now, why do I claim my setup behaves the same as Veritasium's test setup? Well, of course some basic parameters would be different, but the overall theory is the same. Veritasium wires were 1 meter apart and mine are like 1 millimeter apart. It was an arbitrary number anyway, so in my case the energy reaches the lamp faster. The pairs being twisted doesn't change the coupling between them much. So what? Instead of straight capacitors, they turn like a string of DNA. Which makes you ask, in a straight line, the capacitance is between two wires only, but in a bundle like this, all the loops are side by side and capacitively coupled. Or in terms of electric fields, they don't need to travel like two kilometers anymore, they just need to travel the length of this box for the energy to distribute over the wire. No. See, this is why we have a twisted pair. As we discussed, as current flows one way in one wire, it travels in the opposite direction in the other. So we have what we call a differential pair where the signals are opposite. When a twisted pair is placed close to another conductor, the conductor distances alternate back and forth. The positive wire sucks electrons and the negative wire repels them. So the local currents in the adjacent conductor cancel each other and the twisted pair will have minimal effect on the adjacent conductors. That's why having them in a bundle like this doesn't make a difference. That's why we can communicate at high speeds over these cables no matter if they are straight or looped. But then you might ask, the looping wires create a transformer and the magnetic fields of one loop affects the other one. No. Let's measure the inductance of one wire in a pair only. These are the ends of a single thousand foot wire through all these loops and the measured inductance is 18.1 millihenry, which is quite a lot and would easily filter high frequency. Now let's connect the end of the pair together. Basically we are putting two wires in series. You would think two series inductances would mean double the total inductance or especially looped like this, the total inductance could be closer to four times. Measuring the total inductance, it's around 185 microhenry, almost 100 times smaller than a single wire. And this is the magic of a differential pair. See, self-inductance of a single wire is due to the fields formed around the wire. In our setup though, we are running two wires side by side with currents flowing in opposite directions. So the fields that wrap around both wires run in opposite directions cancelling each other, which is great! Magnetic fields are killing each other and this reduces inductance. Same thing happens in Veritasium's straight wires or a twisted pair. That's why I can do the same Veritasium test like this. Convinced? Then let's do it! CHAT5 has four pairs of twisted wire, each wire is a thousand feet here. So I have a total of 8,000 feet or over 2400 meters of round trip. But I have to connect them right. Every pair must connect in series to the next pair for the loop to work right. If we randomly connect wires to create the loop, we will get strange results because we will throw out everything I said about pairs. 
The CAD5 transmission line cable has a characteristic impedance of 100 ohms. So to match it, if instead of a lamp I place a 100 ohm resistor, almost as soon as I close the switch, the load will see half the supply voltage. Then after the waves travel the length of the wire, hit the short circuit at the end and return, the load voltage jumps to the supply voltage. <laughs> now I get to use my 1 GHz scope to see these fast transients and the longest loop of wire in existence in my room. And instead of a switch, I'll give it a 5 volt pulse train to turn the voltage on and off. Which I'll send through a driver circuit with almost 0 ohm source resistance. Otherwise, our function generator has a 50 ohm source resistance that can mess with our results. We connect the supply to the loop and... There we have it, let's zoom in. Yellow is the supply voltage and green is the load voltage. I was expecting a flat step at 2.5 volt. It does jump to 2.5 volts, but it drops and then it rises not even to the power supply. It just sticks down there. Something broken? Oh, I know. See, the 8,000 foot loop has around 220 something ohm resistance. The model of the transmission line I showed was ignoring the wire resistance for shorter lines. Mine is long. If we add those in, these resistors will not let the line capacitances to charge easily and the voltage drops as the waves travel through the length of the line. Well, we did test the longest loop and we can't get rid of the line resistance. But let me show you something cool. This spot is when the reflections of the waves from the end of the loop return to the load and make a change. If I disconnect and reconnect the end of the loop, you see the first uh, 12 microseconds stays untouched. I guess I could have used a 1 MHz scope for this test. So as we predicted, the waves have to travel at the speed of light to the end of the loop and return to the load before the load knows that the end was shorted or open. And with 12 microseconds over 8,000 feet, we get the speed of light, which is of course... What did I do? I got 203 million meters per second. That's not 300 million meters per second, that's two-thirds. 66% of the speed of light. What did I do? It is 8,000 feet, says, right? All right. The speed of light is almost 300 million meters per second in vacuum. It changes in different dielectric mediums. So here we see it drops to 66% in this cable. Good confirmation. Let's reduce the line resistance. I'm gonna cut 40 meters of cable and only use a single pair for my loop. The line resistance would be negligible and hopefully we can get a straight step. 40 meters of twisted pair would be 80 meters of total loop length which would be 400 nanoseconds of wave round trip. Okay, 40 meters of cable and a single pair. I'm still using a 100 ohm load resistance because the line characteristic impedance is not changed and the end of the loop is shorted and if we look at the load voltage we see <laughs> it steps into 2.5 volt middle of the 5 volt supply for around 400 nanoseconds and then steps to 5 volt supply. Well, clearly my driver can't supply a sharp and clean input voltage to the circuit, but you get the idea. And again, the load only knows if I've connected or disconnected the end of the loop after the waves travel the length of the loop at the speed of light through this medium. Beauty! Let's put a 50 ohm as the load. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> now it takes multiple steps for the load voltage to settle. The waves keep reflecting from the ends of the loop. You see the sharp edge of the step is getting wider as the pulse travels multiple times through the length of the cable and filters out. And if we open the loop, after the first step, there are multiple steps before the voltage settles around zero. <laughs> Let's try a 200 ohm. Now the first step is more than half and the next steps overshoot and undershoot around the supply before they settle. Open, close, open, close, open. Well, hopefully we learned a few things today. Such as my sponsor Brilliant is a great place to learn from basic to professional level knowledge in math, computing and science. 
Do I have to repeat myself? You can sign up and start learning for free using my link brilliant.org slash electroboom. Then, if you're not too late, you might be among the first 200 people who'll get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And enjoy learning what you need for your job, school or interview from some of the best interactive courses there. I personally learn better when I can see how my actions change the outcome of something. And that's how Brilliant teaches complex concepts. One of the reasons I enjoy going through Brilliant programs is their interactive quizzes. It's like playing a game where you have to test yourself to pass the level and to be proud of yourself. Because it's actual useful knowledge you must know and improve upon. And you know what happens to those who don't learn? They turn into flat earthers. And you don't want to be a flat earther. So don't wait around. Sign up using my link and start getting better at what really matters. Knowledge. And thank you for watching.